The apostle in these verses exhibits the most lively image of hypocrisy. Was there ever a more beautiful veil than that under which the Jew presents himself? He is a man of confession, of praise, of thanksgiving, a man whose trust is in the law, whose boast is of God, who knows his will, who approves of things that are excellent, a man who calls himself a conductor of the blind, a light of those who are in darkness, an instructor of the ignorant, a teacher of babes, a man who directs others, who preaches against theft, against adultery, against idolatry, and to some up the whole, a man who glories in the commandments of the Lord. Who would not say that this is an angel arrayed in human form, a star detached from the firmament and brought nearer to enlighten the earth? But observe what is concealed under this mask. It is a man who is himself untaught. It is a thief, an adulterer, a sacrilegious person, in one word, a wicked man who continually dishonors God by the transgression of his law. Is it possible to imagine a contrast more monstrous than between these fair appearances and this awful reality? Doubtless Paul might have presented a greater assemblage of particular vices prevalent among the Jews, for there were few to which that nation was not addicted. But he deems it sufficient to generalize them all under these charges, that they did not teach themselves, that they dishonored God by their transgressions of the law, and of these vices he has only particularized three, namely theft, adultery, and sacrilege, and this for two reasons. First, because it was of these three that God had showed the greatest abhorrence in his law, and secondly, because these three sins, in spite of all their professions to the contrary, were usual and common among the Jews, there was no people on earth more avaricious and self-interested than they. It is only necessary to read the narrations of their prophets and historians to be convinced how much they were addicted to robbery, to usury, and to injustice. They were no less obnoxious to the charge of fornication and adultery, as appears from the many charges preferred against them in the writings of the prophets. They converted the offerings to the purposes of their avarice. They profaned the holy places by vile and criminal actions. And as the Lord himself, after Jeremiah, upbraided them, they turned God's house of prayer into a den of thieves." These three capital vices which the apostle stigmatizes in the Jews, like those which he had preferred against the Gentiles, stand opposed, on the one hand, to the three principal virtues, which he elsewhere enumerates as comprehending the whole system of sanctity, namely, to live soberly, righteously, and godly. And on the other hand, they are conformable to the three odious vices which he had noted among the Gentiles, namely, ungodliness, intemperance, unrighteousness. For theft includes in general every notion of unrighteousness, adultery includes that of intemperance, and the guilt of sacrilege that of ungodliness. Hence it is easy to conclude that whatever advantages the Jews possessed above the Gentiles, they were, notwithstanding, in the same condition before the tribunal of God, like them unrighteous, like them intemperate, like them ungodly, and consequently, like them subjected to the same condemnation. Verse 24, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written, the charge alleged here against the Jews is not that they themselves blasphemed the name of God, as some understand it, but that they gave occasion to the heathen to blaspheme. The apostle is not charging the Jews with speaking evil of God or with one particular sin, but with the breach of their law in general. He here confirms what he had just said to this purpose in the foregoing verse, by the authority of Scripture. Many suppose that he refers to a passage of Isaiah in 52.5, where the prophet says, And my name continually every day is blasphemed. But there the prophet does not charge the Jews as having, by their bad conduct, occasioned the injury which the name of God received. He ascribes it, on the contrary, to the Assyrians, by whom they had been subjected. 